Yeah, I'm a rambler. <laughs> so how did the two of you find each other? I feel like I'm doing J-Date now or something. <laughs> but <laughs> Yeah, um, you know, I, you know, I found a lot of the, some of the trainers had become outspoken after the death of Don Rancho. Mm -hmm. And uh, John actually had not. Um, so it was actually after he quit SeaWorld that I was uh, able to sort of get a hold of him and, and knew that he had um, a lot of concerns about the well-being of the whales, you know, during the time he was there. Um, and then, you know, I think uh, we were sort of, you know, introduced uh, via some channels. Um, and uh, But it was only really until after he quit SeaWorld where um, we were able to just sort of talk freely and, you know, um, and then even then, I think, you were still a little bit hesitant about, mm -hmm. you know, who is this woman and Absolutely. what do you mean, you know, what, yeah. what do you mean when you say documentary or feature length documentary? Yeah. I mean, you know, that's, you know, we had to sort of develop, I think, a rapport mm -hmm. and he had developed like a little bit of a trust um, or whatnot. So you got a big smirk on your face when she said channels. <laughs> yes. Well, you know, just like thinking back about how quickly it happened, you know, mm -hmm. too. And it needed to happen quick because she was at the very end of, I believe you had at that point been working on the film for a year and a half at least. Yeah. yeah. So and so end. I think uh, I was the last thing you shot before you went to post-production, right? That's exactly right. Yeah. In terms of an interview. Yeah. So I feel like I got lucky to be able to be a part of it at the end, but I wasn't ready, you know, I couldn't be a part of it until when it happened, you know, because mm -hmm. I had just left SeaWorld. Uh, so from the time that I officially resigned my position at SeaWorld, I gave the interview a week later. So the culture so of that, I mean, as you see it in the movie as well, um, there, uh, are there trainers who believe in the SeaWorld notion of how the world is? Are there trainers, oh, yeah. are trainers convincing themselves because they love the job and they love being near the animals? Or Yeah, it's... Uh, you know, I think because the animals are so powerful, um, you and it's so seductive of an environment and, and, and what you're doing every day with the whales, that it's easy to uh, create your own little world and how you view it and how you think. And but, you know, any of his trainers that are experienced as we get you know progressed up through the ranks, you do start to see those things that are are not in the animal's best interest, and you do start to speak out and, and want to change that. But even as a very experienced trainer. Mm -hmm. There's very little, if anything, you can do to stop corporate SeaWorld from making those decisions that you don't agree with. Mm -hmm. But uh, but it is a very um, cult-like environment, um, and we are very programmed to think a certain way about those whales and what we do. And even though us as trainers, we're there because we love the whales and you know we, we want the best life possible for them. So do people just get exhausted and unable to do that anymore? Is that, I mean, I don't know why you left, but. Uh, actually, technically, I, well, I left because I was so disenchanted by a lot of the things that were going on, but I was also able to take medical on my knee because I had so much cartilage destruction from years of killer whale water work because our bodies just get tore up doing that. I've had so many injuries and surgeries and, but, um, but you know, I see personally uh, trainers, uh, female trainers that as they get older and they start to have families and their priorities shift, you know, the risk that they were willing to take with the whales when they were younger, now that they have a child, which I, I can't relate to because I don't have my own children, but you know, then they're like, I'm not willing to take this risk anymore. And then also injuries force people out, um, family commitments force people out because it is just such a, that is your whole world and that's all you're, you're able to do and it's very risky. So is this a career for 20-somethings? Is that really, in some ways, the... That's always how I looked at it. I always sort of <clears throat> likened it to kind of your first job out of college. And for whatever reason, you know... Um, With your PhD in uh, marine biology, of course. <laughs> oh, clearly. <laughs> clearly. Um, yeah, I mean, you know, you, you're out of college, and then the f in your mind, you, you kind of think that you're this fully developed person. I mean, at least, you know, you're in your 20s or whatever, and you think, okay, I am who I am. Mm -hmm. And... Um, and you actually take on, you know, the first job you get, oftentimes out of college, you kind of, it kind, you think it defines you, and you think that those people are going to be some of your best friends forever. And but you know, it's the first time you really are a true sort of grown up, and so you're so um, impressionable at that age, and you know, you're any you, the time your boss yells at you, mm -hmm. you just can't get over it, and it's you know, um, you go out for drinks with friends, and this this is your life, and. Um, 
you never realize that this is going to be one of many jobs and one of many lives and that you actually aren't necessarily really a fully developed person yet. Mm -hmm. So um, I always likened it to that because I remember having those jobs. But well, you're also fearless at that age. Oh, you're yeah. fearless. Yeah. That you're fearless and you're, um, you're a pleaser, right? You're starting at the bottom mm -hmm. and you can sort of eyeball where you want to be and you know you have to take all sorts of stuff. Um, uh, to be able to sort of march up there and you need to shut up and be quiet when you see something bad um, uh, oftentimes and not talk back and not be an upstart. So, you know, it's all these things kind of um, that in my mind kind of, uh, I guess, sort of, you know, makes you vulnerable at that age. Mm -hmm. And you have to face your own mortality in that career, you know, because like you said, in, in when you're younger, you feel like you're going to live forever. You're going to be the first person to never get old. You know, it's not going to happen to you. And uh, and you're you're physically fit and you're strong and you just feel like I can do this forever. And then once, you know, because doing killer well water work when I was in my 20s compared to doing killer well water work when I was in my mid 30s, it hurt like hell. I mean, and it was so much different. I actually even had to, you know, alter my style even in the water with the whales to compensate for now that the pains that I had in back and knee and all that kind of stuff. So you do get to that point where you realize I'm not going to be able to do this forever. You know, what's going to happen when I no longer can swim with these whales? And, and what happens to those people? I mean, are there many people who are still at SeaWorld at 45 who are... Yeah, they get put out to pasture though. So they get, that's what we would say in the, at work, that they, they toss us out like trash. They put us at uh, Sea Lion Stadium, or uh, <laughs> which I'm sure my Sea Lion buddies will love to hear that. But, uh, <laughs> but you know, that's what they do. They just like, okay, your body's broken down now, you're older. And uh, despite all your relationships and your experience with these whales, we're just going to move you. We're going to move you to another area with animals you don't have a relationship with, don't whatever, because it is a young person's and it's such a, a conflict because to for the whales it takes so much experience and so many years to get to that point but then your body can't do it for very long by so the you time this, you've worked to yeah. get there you're actually you have like a tiny window as yeah. you described it tiny window of actually like being a professional to, athlete almost it, yes that's exactly what yeah it you know the like aches and pains are there when you're 23 but you overlook them and then right. you're 40 or 32 or whatever right it's like this right. is too much and they don't ever go lows. away <laughs> uh -huh. yeah those aches and pains at 42 or they don't go away where in yeah. 23 you wake up the next day and they're gone <laughs> so mm -hmm. so when somebody moves to the sea lions i mean is there a movie bl called black lion coming or <laughs> I mean, is that, are those animals better cared for? Are they able to like get over the notion of what may be happening with the killer whales and two takes over? <laughs> or are they still, right, right. or do you just have to forget that that happened to keep your job and now you're working in a corporate sea world environment and yeah, sticking I, with it? Well, I think the sea lions, uh, I mean, those conditions, those animals, those facilities are even worse condition, you know, because obviously they do put most of the money with the killer whales mm -hmm. because it's the main attraction and obviously require more money and require more but yeah if anyone looks at the sea lion facilities mm -hmm. uh those are like deplorable conditions mm -hmm. for those animals those animals go blind they have a lot of hip issues because they're always on the concrete and doing these uh you know behaviors in the show that put a lot of stress on their joints but uh so yeah the killer whales is one issue where obviously their needs are not being met in that environment but if you go to Sea Lion Stadium or even Dolphin Stadium, those pools and those facilities are even worse. Mm -hmm. there were, uh, I remember when the movie premiered at Sundance, oh, so many months ago. <laughs> seems like a long time, doesn't it? It seems like a real time. It must seem like yeah. a long time. It must be longer than making the film almost. Oh, clearly. The last seven months. <laughs> yeah. But I mean, there was a sense of fear almost in the room, a little bit of interpretation about, okay, we're going to show this in public and now we're going to see what kind of <laughs> excrement yeah. storm it comes from uh, SeaWorld. Is the, are, are you now over that hump? Is now that it's a public <clears throat> issue and everybody's seeing it, does it stop feeling Personally, so? Personally, no. I'm not over that hump. I mean, I'm never, I'm never not, I think, a little bit scared. I just have to be sort of honest with myself with that. You know, I mean, this is, um, you know, I'm not really this um, controversial, combative person by nature. And like, you know, the fact that I started making this movie with this whole other movie in mind. I mean, I had this sort of philosophical movie in mind about, you know, human beings and our relationships with like these, you know, predator counterparts of ours. And it was sort of exploratory and all this stuff. And so when I started learning what I learned and realized I have sort of no choice but to mm -hmm. be sort of the mouthpiece for this information and really make this film, um, 
I just was sort of laughing to myself because like all my prior work, you know, my, my sort of feature work that I, mm. you know, developed or whatnot is really sort of softer. It's like about children and very inspirational. And so um, it's just so strange for me to be here because I think that in terms of the stick it to the man thing, you know, mm -hmm. there are people who just do that better than me. That, that it's in their DNA. <laughs> and so, you know what I mean? There's the Michael Moores out there. I mean, they're just drooling over this stuff. And, sure. and this landed on my lap. And I just knew that once, you know, there was, there was no turning back for me. And that was probably very important that it was actually me doing it, you know, because um, I tried to be fair. I tried to, uh, you know, uh, interview SeaWorld, all these things. Um, but they're awkward shoes to fill. Like, it's not, I'm not, you know, pump, mm -hmm. fist pumping. And it's just, it's a very <laughs> strange place for me to be. Um, so, and, but, you know, I'm armed mm -hmm. with this. I'm armed with the truth, and it's a truthful 80 minutes, and I, I, that's when I feel confident, that's why. Do you think it would have been as enticing to you to jump into this if it were somebody who was more rah-rah, go get them? Uh, no, I actually needed her to be the way she is, because I was very, because uh, I just left SeaWorld last August, and um, you know, so it was very fresh, and I was still having to come to terms with how I processed me speaking out, like was it gonna really hurt the whales if I spoke out? And it was kind of just a rolling of the dice leap of faith speaking to her because I didn't want to speak out with the journalist and then feel exploited all over again. That's mm -hmm. what was important to me. But I had no way of really knowing if that's the way she was going to go or not. But when she interviewed me in Seattle and she was, you know, off camera asking me the, the, the questions, mm -hmm. the questions she was asking me and my answers, she was tearing up off camera and it I knew really then I was like I made the right decision because her heart is in the right place on these questions and these issues and she got it the, the questions that she was asking she got the dynamics of, of what was happening but I could have been unlucky so I'm glad that I got lucky see I when you talk about the other films and you kind of you know they're about children and uh, mm -hmm. is that I kind of feel like this film is uh, in some ways most important for our generation of children you know, as parents, yeah. um, and I think I felt this way even before I was a parent. There was a documentary, um, I think we talked about it last time, and I finally looked it up, but about the Miami Seaquarium mm -hmm. and their killer whale and how they basically drove the thing nuts by being this very small tank compared to even SeaWorld. Mm -hmm. um, and how you really, like, how do you go back to SeaWorld ever mm -hmm. again? You look at those ads, which are some of which are in the movie, right? Um, mm -hmm. and you think about how you, the morality of how you raise a child in this world. I know. And it's interesting because, um, one, you know, I, you know, despite my trepidation or whatever, like there was just sort of no turning back and I just knew that it was just my directive and I just kind of marched ahead without even really sort of thinking about anything else. Mm. Um, but, you know, I have two kids. I definitely, they're seven, seven-year-old twins and definitely made this so that they would be able to sit through it, you know? That's just, mm. I, I think, despite the fact that it seems like the most graphic and intense and scary thing there's really like there's not um you know imagery in there that that a kid can't handle mm -hmm. um but the content is intense you know when you know that a calf is being separated from mother so those are the things that really um resonate with my kids but what's interesting is that um the kids that that screen it um they sort of um are feeling all i guess the right things like they just know it. They they sort of come out of the womb like already having empathy, already being mm -hmm. like, oh wait, they swim a hundred miles, and they're in these pools. Like you know, it doesn't. You don't have a lot of um, undoing to do mm -hmm. ethically with with kids. Like they sort of come out feeling these things anyway. I actually think it's adults that you know over four decades mm -hmm. of time have started you know mm -hmm. believing the fairy tale and we were taught a story and we never undid our own you know um brainwashing but you know what i mean we That's never so undid cool. it it's ourselves so cool that but kids the, can, yeah, yeah they yeah. just seem to get it in fact there's the pull down scene mm -hmm. with um with ken peters which is which is harrowing especially for adults because you know you're actually hyperventilating you're trying to breathe with him mm -hmm. and you're just thinking to yourself if that were me i don't know if i'd make it i mean you're really sort of putting yourself in his shoes Kids, they all are wondering why she's doing what she's doing. <laughs> it's just amazing. They're like, oh, yeah, yeah, he's definitely struggling, but why is she so mad? Mm -hmm. It's just been sort of a That's fascinating thing. They're not terrified That's um, cool. for the human being. They're wondering, like, 
what did someone do to make her mad? Mm -hmm. So, um, which I, is true, and, and they're right on the right on the money. <laughs> exactly, exactly. You you know yeah. more about that event, absolutely. Well, as adults, we also have to undo the decades of participation. You know, we yeah. a lot of people went to those places and mm -hmm. got thrilled by the water coming over the tank and all that stuff, right. and watching those shows. And then it's like, well, you know, was I a participant in uh, right. this oh, yeah. this terrible thing? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I patronized it. I took my kids there. You yeah. know, I went to SeaWorld. I went to SeaWorld as a kid. And then as a mom, you know, I went there as well. So, um, yeah. So, I mean, I think uh, that was that helped inform, I think, the direction of the movie because I knew that um, rather than coming, you know, rather than making a movie that just presumes things are right and wrong in the world and, you know, the, the movie's hysterical and sort of yelling at everybody to just wake up, how can we do this to these animals? I preferred kind of, um, I guess, humility you know, in terms of like a little bit of my own sort of, you know, confession of thinking this was this beautiful place, this beautiful marine park that did everything mm -hmm. right. Mm -hmm. And um, that's why I think um, these guys had to be my voice in it because they have the same humility and they have the same, I thought it was this and I only learned afterwards that it was something else. And mm -hmm. um, almost sort of like, it felt like taking confession for a couple of them, you know, it was just really interesting. They had to sort of get it off their chest, you know, what they had seen before really feeling good. Well, and I think that's where SeaWorld's brilliant at their, you know, you have to give them credit. They're brilliant at crafting their image. You know, and if people come to SeaWorld, like Gabriella, with, I understand why people would come and bring their kids and mm -hmm. those animals are so impressive even when you just look at them, you know. So to see them in any capacity, even if you're at that little rinky-dink Miami Sea Aquarium facility, which is heartbreaking for that whale, mm -hmm. but she's still so impressive. You cannot go to an environment like that and go, oh my God, that, that's amazing. Mm -hmm. So, But that's where I feel like the company, they exploit and take advantage of us because when people come and they're a little, um, they're a little on the fence or even more on the other side of the fence about, mm -hmm. I don't think this is really right about animals being captivity. Mm -hmm. But when they come and they see us, the trainers, and how much we love those animals and they see that relationship, and then, of course, they see the, the technical end of it and the screens and the lights and the music. They come away and go, oh, well, those whales seem really happy. They seem like they have a good life. Maybe this is okay. Mm -hmm. So that's part of that, uh, you They're know. Smiling. Yeah, that's yeah, part that's of right. tricking that's the right. people that you're not really seeing what's really happening. So is there such thing as a good captivity or an okay captivity? I mean, there are a lot of aquariums that have mm -hmm. big animals and... Uh, you know, seem to be more interested in important things. I right, guess, right. Sea World. Well, I think that you know, I'm sort of careful just because I just don't know a lot beyond mm. you know my little area in these two years that I was researching. So I don't know that much about zoos. Um, some of what I'm hearing and some of what I'm kind of coming to understand is that you know, personally, I don't think sentient, intelligent, you know, these free roaming animals should be in captivity. Period. So that goes for elephants. That goes for primates. I mean, to me, it's just it's it's so clear. Um, after learning about the killer whale world, mm -hmm. that um, that can't be right. That said, zoos, you know, a lot of them are actually dedicated to conserving an entire species. You know, um, they're educational. Those animals right. are not coming out and performing for you to get their food. Right. So, um, by and large, like you know, I think um, maybe there's a gradient. You know, I mean, there mm -hmm. are going to be zoos that do well, mm -hmm. and then there are going to be terrible zoos. So. Um, yeah. You know, yeah, without really sort of knowing more about mm -hmm. it, I think I'm sort of starting to uh, develop a little more of a point of view um, it's, on it, that. It's the whole um, in captivity for entertainment purposes that I feel like is just mm -hmm. a throwback in time and that, you know, it's, it's kind of over. We call it the, long, the lowest rung on the ethical totem pole. <laughs> <laughs> Out of all of it, you know, it's just like the, the goofy tricks and everything is, is yeah. circus act. And when you, you know, if you go to any of the SeaWorld shows now, I mean, there is no dignity in any of those shows for the whales or the trainers, but especially the whales. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, there's no education content in those shows anymore. The shows that we did in the late uh, 90s, early 2000s, I was more proud of those shows that we did because we actually had education in our shows. But now SeaWorld, instead of evolving forward, they actually have gone backward. Mm 
And now we had, you know, we were in like glittered wetsuits, dancing with glow sticks. It was humiliating. Mm -hmm. So it's like, how did we go from we're supposed to be conservation? Yeah, please don't look for it. I I'm saw so a lot of it. I promise you, you don't. <laughs> yeah, it's terrible. But you know, it's just like you know, if that's embarrassing for us, I mean, look at what you're doing with these whales. This is the image that you're putting out for the people that are coming that are supposed to be educated about these animals. This is embarrassing for them. You know? Mm -hmm. Well, it's interesting those advertisements that are particularly in the film of the whales kind of floating through air, yeah. which actually gives you that sense of space <laughs> that they don't actually have. Yeah. That's I mean, it's almost like very huh? specific. Yeah, kind of a three dimensional, mm -hmm. you know. Yeah, oh, like they're the free. world is their place. And <laughs> they just happen to come here to see world to, <laughs> to meet to pay, with you. Pay a brief visit. That's right. <laughs> That's right. So, how long? I mean, so you started as a. There's the physical world of the trainer. Uh, and the learning curve of it was there a point did it, how long did it take you to kind of have a relationship I mean where was the point where you kind of yeah. had an emotional thing where it started to become a problem uh oh you mean having a problem with what I was doing well, or I mean was there a point where you evolved into okay now there's a personal relationship and now uh, that I've spent two years thinking about this personal relationship I'm now beginning to feel bad about oh yeah okay um uh, for me, I mean, when I kind of like look back at it, I would say around the four year mark, I started to question some of the things like, because I was so emotionally attached at that point in my relationships. Uh, and then yet I knew enough at that level. I was just starting to get enough experience at Shamu Stadium that I, I was starting to be privy to more information that I was like, well, wait a second, that's not necessarily the animal's best interest. So I'd say the four year mark and then, you know, every year as you, you gain more experience and get higher in the ranks and are privy to more information and more decision making, then you're like, well wait a second, this is wrong. We can't take this calf away from her mother. Mm -hmm. We can't, you know, ask these whales to go in the med pool. We talked about that. Yeah, that's pool. Right. That's right. <laughs> um so yeah, so I think it, I think the longer you're there and you're privy to more information just based on hierarchy alone, that's until you really see all the decision making that's going on behind the scenes. So did you guys go out to the bar afterwards and you know have a drink and go, oh um, man, I can't believe they did that today. I mean, is that well, yeah? You, you mean, all share it that way. Well, that's what's such an interesting uh, psychology of it is because we would us experienced trainers, we would be in the locker room, you know, changing, showering, whatever, and we would talk about like that, you know, this was bullshit, we shouldn't be doing this with these whales, whatever. But the moment that we leave those gates at Shamu Stadium, we are so programmed to fiercely defend what we are doing. So I remember just my own personal re reaction. I mean, I, I, I'm embarrassed to say that if someone came at me and said, I don't think it's right you keeping killer whales in captivity, I came out very harshly at those people because I felt personally attacked. I felt like they were saying, you don't love those whales when I knew I loved those whales. I wanted the best life for them. Mm -hmm. But so I, I can understand too now why some of my friends and former colleagues are reacting so harshly to me now speaking out. Mm -hmm. We're just so programmed to defend it. And also there's a there's an element of it of storytelling like you know I kind of went into that a little bit but there's um you know like nobody goes to work every day thinking they're doing something evil mm -hmm. like this is just this goes for the whole Wall Street debacle the, you know there's you you just go to work right and mm -hmm. um, you see stuff that that you know passes your desk or you know in this case you see stuff being done with whales and you know it's not right but for whatever reason you have told yourself a story. To sort of justify the things that you do, and like I think you know, it's not only SeaWorld telling the fairy tale of the happy Shamu image mm -hmm. for four decades. It's also just you as a person telling your story that um, whether you know maybe it's not that bad, or gosh, I mean these whales couldn't survive in the ocean anyway. So at least we're, we're giving them the best life possible, or or this is just a brief job for me anyway. Like you know what, I'm going right. to be out of here. Um, or we're teaching ultimately. I mean, there's a million kind of stories that we can tell ourselves. Mm -hmm. um, Working my way through college. That's it. I mean, right? <laughs> like, I mean, you just sort of say, I'm a part-timer. I don't, you know, I don't really, I'm not in charge of that. And, but it's that, you know, and then it's the whole, you know, the, when the good people stay silent, that's when the bad stuff happens, right? So it's not you personally, it's that you're privy to things that you know aren't right. And um, that's kind of why I commend people for speaking out because at some point, you know, But even in a non-public setting, I mean, do you guys, do you ever, is it like, 
you know, alcoholics who just drink together and they don't ever sh talk about what they're doing? Or, I mean, are, is there ever a conversation between you and three other trainers going, you know, God, we got to do something about this? Yeah, we, we just had can't those. say it to each other. No, we had those for sure. And I mean, there were, um, there were some of us that were more vocal than others. I, I was definitely one of the more vocal trainers. I get in trouble all the time for speaking out and saying we can't do this. But there were other trainers too that were that were as vocal as I was. But yeah, we would we would get together and say this is not right and we can't do that. So, um, um, but you know, making it happen, making corporate SeaWorld listen and make those changes is a totally different ballgame. Mm -hmm. Even if you're a very experienced trainer. Well, the public thing. I mean, it's that whole step between the private and the public. I mean, it sounds, not only were you a bit brainwashed by every whole system, but it's like, that's, how does that power help? And I imagine you have some issues that you were abandoning, you know, that for the, it's easier to try to do something from the inside than from the outside. Absolutely. Like, you, you, I felt like if I left, and I know that John Jett in the film, feels, he felt the same way about Tilikum, but I felt, how could I leave and abandon all of these whales I love, but especially Takara, who I was closest to, mm -hmm. if I leave, and I know I'm the strongest voice for her, who is going to fight as hard as I am to say, we can't do that to her. We can't treat her like a baby machine. We cannot uh, strip her from another calf. We cannot do all these things. So you do feel like if I, if I leave, I'm abandoning her. And you know, what kind of life is she gonna have? But it took me a while to come to, around to this, but now I feel like this is a way I can still care for her and hopefully be a voice for change that I couldn't do even as an experienced trainer on the inside. You know, they wouldn't listen to me as an experienced trainer, but they will respond to media pressure. I believe in that, so. So it's been just under a year for you since you've been out? Yeah, yeah August. I, I left on medical leave in May, and then I officially resigned my position in August. So how are you doing? Um, the knee is much more manageable since I've been gone because, you know, being at work was just brutal on mm -hmm. it. But, uh, yeah, I'm doing... Uh, how are you doing emotionally? <laughs> emotionally? You know, I, I've come to terms with all aspects of leaving SeaWorld and all that bullshit, and I don't mm -hmm. care, but leaving the whales behind is tough. Um, especially, and you can't really visit. No, I can't really visit, and I would never want to reduce myself to go and look at her just in that, from a public mm -hmm. perspective after I knew what we had and swimming with her all those years and with her with giving birth to her babies, all that. So. I just feel like now I had to choose, like, that's a death. I'll never see her again. Mm -hmm. And again, I loved all the whales, but for her, you know, she was the one I was closest to. And I'm still not over that. I don't know. I mean, today, sitting here, I don't know if I'll ever feel like I'm totally over leaving her. But I just kind of right now just push it off to the side and I deal with, I'm good with leaving the bullshit of SeaWorld behind. Yeah. Well, like any lost great relationship, you know, they stick with you. You can't, I mean, that's, that makes us human, I guess. Yeah, you yeah. mourn it. You mourn it for sure. And, I'm, <clears throat> you know, it was a privilege to be have a relationship with her and all the whales. And I, I will always hold on to that and not be ashamed of that because I love them and I, I, I want them to have a better life. So what can the public do? I mean, what is the call to action at this point? Is there, is pressure mm -hmm. on SeaWorld about how they treat the animals or is it about boycotting? Is it about, what's the... It's a long, um, you know, list of things, all of which I think we see as being sort of valuable. Um, I think that uh, we all agree that um, SeaWorld should not shut its doors. We're not out there advocating that they sort of fire everybody and go away. Wouldn't happen anyway. Um, but for, you know, a $2 billion industry, a $2 billion uh, a year industry, um, they probably have the only financial resources to actually make these kind of valuable um, systemic changes mm -hmm. to this this whole animals and entertainment thing. So we think of rehabilitation and release facilities, mm -hmm. you know, that they could do. We think of um, we are advocating sort of a sea pen, or essentially cordoning off a cove with with a net, and you sort of semi-retire the whales that are there now, because mm -hmm. um, you can't just dump them in the ocean like people think you can. Mm -hmm. They they don't eat live right. fish. So they don't know how to chase down their own food. That would be hu this huge process. But also they're hopped up on, um, a lot of them have antibiotics and they would not probably last very long. So this way, would, uh, they, they could at least be in a natural ocean environment, feel those sort of, you know, mm -hmm. natural currents and everything for the first time and be killer whales in sort of a 
semi-dignified fashion for a while. Mm -hmm. And we also think that SeaWorld could profit for that and that yeah. there's something incredibly valuable about actually, about actually seeing a killer whale. You know, so these are some of the most, you know, impossible majestic animals. See it doing what it does. You know, how about that? Um, so, but you know, all of this stuff and none, none of this stuff can really happen if we just continue to go through the turnstiles, right. you know, and if we are okay with the captive breeding, we need to sort of stop the captive breeding because otherwise there will be whales there for another hundred years. Mm. You know, so there's, it's, you know, a multi-step program. We have a website and all that stuff, but it's a, it's a sort of, you know, tra we re recognize that it's sort of transitional, but um, we have to just encourage them um, by not going and uh, encourage them to kind of make these changes and evolve. And is there any give on that side of it at this point? I mean, is there anybody just don't know. thinking about it or <clears throat> talking about it or? You know, people for decades have been talking about it. Um, but, you know, the only way I think really for a company like that to, to make change is if they realize that that their business model, mm -hmm. um, forget about ethical, they can even just mm -hmm. forget right. about the whole ethical right. argument. Just if they can see that as being um, an unsustainable system right now and a system that the general public doesn't support um, and they lose money as a result of not changing, mm -hmm. that's what can sort of spur us on to sort of, you know, be just a better life for the whales, I guess. Because I don't care why they do it to mm -hmm. make a, a better life for those whales because I know that they're going to, any changes that they make, it's not going to be because it's true from the heart, it's going to be, oh, they're going to try to repair their PR mm -hmm. you know, image, but okay, just do it. I don't care why you do it. Just right. do it. But, uh, Make money off it. We'll do it. Whatever, you know? And, and historically, SeaWorld <clears throat> has, um, they live in another world and they really have felt untouchable and mm -hmm. that they did not need to change their business model. I think this is a different thing that they've never had to deal with. So I do hope that they come to the realization that they are going to need to change their business model. But in the past, they felt like we don't need to do anything. We're we're going to continue doing because I've been in those meetings and I've been told by senior management we are going to continue to operate like we've always done. Mm -hmm. You know that was the message and that was after Dom was killed and Alexis was killed and the OSHA hearings and they still responded that way and we were given that directive like we're not changing. Well, and that's what's so hard to reconcile because you know I wouldn't blame someone who is sort of. Um, geared and you know just the business model is sort of in their dna to begin mm -hmm. with you don't blame them for not changing because in their minds they're still doing a good thing because we're still bringing our children there mm -hmm. you know so it's like there's in their minds that sort of justifies that they really don't need to change and in fact they could just make it more entertaining and less educational because that will certainly bring more people in and that's you know? what they've said that's what they've said, they said is that so this why? is what yeah, people want to see is that people have overwhelmingly told them this is what they say right that they just want the edu uh, i'm sorry the entertainment aspect in the show not the education and that's the reason why they've gotten to now where there is no education content in those shows. Well, it's hard to find six-year-olds who want to sit through education and they go to the park. You know, <laughs> that's park. right. That's right. And it's, you know, and it's... And um, parents just want to get the hell out of there. <laughs> yeah. That's a good point. Like, $500 later. Yeah. But I, I'll, I'll tell you something, too, that's kind of funny, is there's a video that's um, where a pelican actually falls into um, uh, a pool at SeaWorld. Mm -hmm. And all the... This is on YouTube. I mean, the whales had been performing a show, but then this pelican falls in, right? Mm -hmm. So the whales just sort of come after the pelican. Mm -hmm. And um, the trainers are frantically slapping the water, which is a way they can recall the whales to kind of come back and, right. and pay attention. And the whales, every single one of the whales, just refuse to even listen. I mean, this is like years of training. Mm -hmm. um, ignore the novel stimulus. Come back to us and mm -hmm. do your little show. And they're just tearing apart this pelican. I mean, it's just yeah. brutal. That said, that thing has probably more hits on YouTube right. than like, you know, the silly little show with the goofy predictable stuff. So in a way, it's like, in my mind, sometimes I sort of think to myself, if you actually let a killer whale be a killer whale, mm -hmm. there's nothing more sort of um, adrenaline charged or um, mm -hmm. unpredictable. I mean, it gives you chills. So um, the problem is, you know, you can't promise everyone they're going to see something amazing every time they drop the hundred bucks to go there. But um, but still, well, what you do see- There are always a lot see, of Christians for those lions, you know? You <laughs> right, right, right. <laughs> but I mean, it's just sort of like- the pelican in there every time. <laughs> yeah, but like just, you know, uh, embrace the fact that you actually have an, an amazing animal mm -hmm. on your hands and, and evolve and think of a way right. um, to let people come and see that. Well, it's interesting because like the, if you go back to 
I forgot his name, but the guy who was the dolphin trainer, the flipper trainer, who was also in the Cove, who shows up in your movie as well. Barry. Barry. You know, when that all started, and that was, he was in Sequarium, Miami, that was, you know, they thought they were doing something good <laughs> initially. Know, right. And it does seem like people <clears throat> really did think they were doing something good 25 years ago, 30 years ago. Yep. Yeah. And as they've evolved to find out this is not such a great idea, you know, adjust, then adjusting it once it's a big business right. mm -hmm. um, right. seems very difficult, particularly without a Mr. SeaWorld. You know, there doesn't seem mm -hmm. to be right. a Walt Disney or a or whatever right. to be the guy who you go, you know, Wait your image is being ruined by. That's a good know. point. Hmm. Hmm. So it's a, it's a really hard, you know, because they did start with good intentions, I think. I don't think they really meant to torture animals. Um, but as it turns out, that's, you know, they figured out they're doing it. And now we have to really try to do something about it. It's and that's exactly right. Because if you, every decade we get a little more advanced, the 60s, the 70s, 80s, 90s, and we think about these types of issues better. And now in 2013, I just feel like people are really ready to look at this and say, this is not good enough anymore. Mm -hmm. But yeah, in the 70s, 80s, even when I started in 93, I didn't think about, you know, I just looked at, oh, SeaWorld is the biggest and best in the world, and these whales have a great life. You didn't really think so much about animals in captivity being wrong mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. for entertainment, especially. Well, and there's another <clears throat> aspect to it as well as, um, you know, a neuroscientist, Lori Marino, was talking to me. She's also in the film about the brain and everything mm -hmm. um, and speaks to that in the film. But she, um, was talking about how we're all primates. So human beings are primates and we feel like in order to learn something, we need to touch it. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> we need to be up and close. And so, um, you know, I do believe that whatever, 40 years ago when we began the mad scientist experiment to put a big predator in captivity, that we were sort of touching and like getting up close and curious and kind of wanting to make a friend, mm -hmm. you know? And, um, and just wanting to, you know, geez, the love I feel for you, do you feel it back? Like, you mm -hmm. know, it's just sort of this, this I think, sort of a feeling. I think it's very human mm -hmm. to be that way. And then the problem is we, on one hand, we started understanding how crazy intelligent they were and then started realizing what it was that they needed, you know, to not only thrive, but really to survive. Mm -hmm. And then the other problem is, is that we fell in love with them. So it's like, once you fall in love with it, it just, it's so weird because we can't imagine it being cruel. Right. You know, or our love being sort mm -hmm. of ending up being a cruel thing, but um, we just simply that's a good point, fell in love, and that's what makes money. Yeah. You know. Mm -hmm. Well, I guess we can't imagine how husbands treated wives thirty years ago, forty years ago, either. <laughs> right. <laughs> or that gay people were actually human beings and not right. some sort of animal. Or black people were, yeah. you know, a full human. <laughs> that's right. I mean, that's, that's all within a hundred years of our that's true. of that's our right. history. So yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. There are campaigns now, and there's all you know, and mm -hmm. the non-human rights project people talk about a lot is that one that's sort of been in development for over a decade about how the animals that we've recognized that you know have language, grieve their young, um, you know, are free roaming. Uh, they have self-recognition, they see themselves in a mirror, they get what's going on with them, they have self-realization, mm -hmm. um, that those animals uh, sort of deserve better, you know, and, and need, need to be afforded sort of um, kind of animal rights protection in the same way that, you know, human beings are now sort of afforded protections and, and rights. So, I mean, it's very forward thinking and who knows mm -hmm. if we're ready to even talk like that. Um, but you really see the argument. Yeah. But what's so cool, I love it, is like hearing about her two kids, her twins, and how they, seriously, how they process hearing these stories or seeing parts of the film. And it's just like you, and also one of our um, Sundance screenings, it was all just high school kids. Oh, yeah. mm -hmm. And the way they responded to it, it was just like, wow, this is the next generation and mm -hmm. this is how they're thinking already. Um, and now they are growing up in a society where, we, you know, black people are looked at as true people and gay people and everything like you just said. Mm -hmm. And I, I think it, it, you know, it's, this is the time now for the change, definitely. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. They're going to do a little better than, than we did, I think. Yeah, I'm definitely. Yeah. Excellent. Thank you guys. Nuts by being this very small tank compared to even SeaWorld. Mm -hmm. um, and how you really like, how do you go back to SeaWorld ever mm -hmm. again? You look at those ads, which are some of which are in the movie. Right. Um, mm -hmm. And you think about how you, the morality of how you raise a child in this world. I know. And it's interesting because um, 
one, you know, I, you know, despite my trepidation or whatever, like there was just sort of no turning back and I just knew that it was just my directive and I just kind of marched ahead without even really sort of thinking about anything else. Mm. Um, but, you know, I have two kids. I definitely, they're seven, seven-year-old twins and definitely made this so that they would be able to sit through it, you know? That's just, mm. I, I think, despite the fact that it seems like the most graphic, and intense and scary thing, there's really like, there's not, um, you know, imagery in there that, that a kid can't handle. Mm -hmm. um, but the content is intense, you know, when you know that a calf is being separated from mother. So those are the things that really um, resonate with my kids. But what's interesting is that um, the kids that, that screen it, um, they sort of um, are feeling all, I guess, the right things. Like they just know it. They, they sort of come out of the womb like already having empathy, already being mm -hmm. like, oh wait, they swim 100 miles and they're in these pools. Like, you know, it doesn't, you don't have a lot of um, undoing to do mm -hmm. ethically with, with kids. Like they sort of come out feeling these things anyway. I actually think it's adults that, you know, over four decades mm -hmm. of time have started you know, mm -hmm. believing the fairy tale and we were taught a story and we never undid our own, you know, um, brainwashing. You know what I mean? We That's never so undid cool. it it's ourselves. So cool that but kids the, can, yeah, yeah, they yeah. just seem to get it. In fact, there's the pull down scene mm -hmm. with um, with Ken Peters, which is which is harrowing, especially for adults, because you know, you're actually hyperventilating. You're trying to breathe with him mm -hmm. and you're just thinking to yourself, if that were me, I don't know if I'd make it. I mean you're really sort of putting yourself in his shoes. Kids, they all are wondering why she's doing what she's doing. <laughs> it's just amazing. They're like, oh, yeah, yeah, he's definitely struggling, but why is she so mad? Mm -hmm. It's just been sort of a That's fascinating thing. They're not terrified That's pretty um, cool. for the human being. They're wondering, like, mm -hmm. what did someone do to make her mad? Mm -hmm. So, um, which I, is true, and, and they're right on the right money. <laughs> exactly, exactly. You, you know yeah. more about that event, absolutely. Well, as adults, we also have to undo the decades of participation. You know, we yeah. a lot of people went to those places and mm -hmm. got thrilled by the water coming over the tank and all that stuff, right. and watching those shows. And then it's like, well, you know, was I a participant in uh, this oh, yeah. this terrible thing? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I patronized it. I took my kids there. You yeah. know, I went to SeaWorld. I went to SeaWorld as a kid, and then as a mom, you know, I went there as well. So, mm -hmm. um, yeah. So I mean, I think uh, that was that helped inform I think the direction of the movie because yeah, I'm a rambler. <laughs> so how did the two of you find each other i feel like i'm doing j-date now or something <laughs> <laughs> but <laughs> yeah um you know i you know i found a lot of the some of the trainers had become outspoken after the death of don rancho mm -hmm. and uh john actually had not um so it was actually after he quit SeaWorld that I was uh, able to sort of get a hold of him and, and knew that he had um, a lot of concerns about the well-being of the whales, you know, during the time he was there. Um, and then, you know, I think uh, we were sort of, you know, introduced uh, via some channels. Um, and uh, but it was only really until after he quit SeaWorld where um, we were able to just sort of talk freely and, you know, um, and then even then, I think, you were still a little bit hesitant about, you know, who is this woman and Absolutely. what do you mean, you know, what yeah. what do you mean when you say documentary or feature length documentary? Yeah. I mean, you know, that's, you know, we had to sort of develop, I think, a rapport mm -hmm. and he had developed like a little bit of a trust um, or whatnot. So you got a big smirk on your face when you said channels. <laughs> yes. Well, <laughs> you know, just like thinking back about how quickly it happened, you know, mm -hmm. too. And it needed to happen quick because she was at the very end of, I believe you had at that point been working on the film for a year and a half at least. Yeah. yeah. So and so end. I think uh, I was the last thing you shot before you went to post-production, right? That's exactly right. Yeah. In terms of an interview. Yeah. So I feel like I got lucky to be able to be a part of it at the end, but I wasn't ready, you know, I couldn't be a part of it until when it happened, you know, because mm -hmm. I had just left SeaWorld. Uh, so from the time that I officially resigned my position at SeaWorld, I gave the interview a week later. So the culture so of that, I mean, as you see it in the movie as well, um, there, uh, are there trainers who believe in the SeaWorld notion of how the world is? Are there trainers, oh, yeah. are trainers convincing themselves because they love the job and they love being near the animals? Or 
Yeah, it's, uh, you know, I think because the animals are so powerful, um, you and it's so seductive of an environment and, and, and what you're doing every day with the whales that it's easy to uh, create your own little world and how you view it and how you think. And, but, you know, any of us trainers that are experienced as we get, you know, progressed up through the ranks, you do start to see those things that are, are not in the animal's best interest and you do start to speak out and, and want to change that. But even as a very experienced trainer, mm -hmm. there's very little, if anything, you can do to stop corporate SeaWorld from making those decisions that you don't agree with. Mm -hmm. but, uh, but it is a very um, cult-like environment um, and we are very programmed to think a certain way about those whales and what we do. And even though us as trainers, we're there because we love the whales and you know we, we want the best life possible for them. I just have to be sort of honest with myself with that. You know, I mean, this is, um, you know, I'm not really this um, controversial combative person by nature. And like, you know, the fact that I started making this movie with this whole other movie in mind. I mean, I had sort of a philosophical movie in mind about, you know, human beings and our relationships with like these, you know, predator counterparts of ours. And, and it was sort of exploratory and all this stuff. And so when I started learning what I learned and realized I have sort of no choice but to mm -hmm. be sort of the mouthpiece for this information and really make this film, um, I just was sort of laughing to myself because like all my prior work, you know, my, my sort of feature work that I, mm. you know, developed or whatnot is really sort of softer. It's like about children and very inspirational. And so um, it's just so strange for me to be here because I think that in terms of the stick it to the man thing, you know, mm -hmm. there are people who just do that better than me. That, that it's in their DNA. <laughs> and so, you know what I mean? There's the Michael Moores out there. I mean, they're just drooling over this stuff. And, sure. and this landed on my lap. And I just knew that once, you know, there was, there was no turning back for me. And that was probably very important that it was actually me doing it, you know, because um, I tried to be fair. I tried to, uh, you know, uh, interview SeaWorld, all these things. Um, but there are awkward shoes to fill. Like, it's not, I'm not, you know, pump, mm -hmm. fist pumping. And it's just, it's a very <laughs> strange place for me to be. Um, so, and, but, you know, I'm armed mm -hmm. with this. I'm armed with the truth, and it's a truthful 80 minutes, and I, I, that's when I feel confident, that's why. Do you think it would have been as enticing to you to jump into this if it were somebody who was more rah-rah, go get them? Uh, no, I actually needed her to be the way she is, because I was very, because uh, I just left SeaWorld last August, and um, you know, so it was very fresh, and I was still having to come to terms with how I processed me speaking out, like was it gonna really hurt the whales if I spoke out? And it was kind of just a rolling of the dice leap of faith speaking to her because I didn't want to speak out with the journalist and then feel exploited all over again. That's mm -hmm. what was important to me. But I had no way of really knowing if that's the way she was going to go or not. But when she interviewed me in Seattle and she was, you know, off camera asking me the, the, the questions, mm -hmm. the questions she was asking me and my answers, she was tearing up off camera and it I knew really then I was like I made the right decision because her heart is in the right place on these questions and these issues and she got it the, the questions that she was asking she got the dynamics of, of what was happening but I could have been unlucky so I'm glad that I got lucky see I when you talk about the other films and you kind of you know they're about children and uh, mm -hmm. is that I kind of feel like this film is uh, in some ways most important for our generation of children you know, as parents, yeah. um, and I think I felt this way even before I was a parent. There was a documentary, um, I think we talked about it last time, and I finally looked it up, but about the Miami Seaquarium mm -hmm. and their killer whale and how they basically drove the things that I had and back and knee and all that kind of stuff. So you do get to that point where you realize, I'm not going to be able to do this forever. You know, what's going to happen when I no longer can swim with these whales? And, and what I'm, happens to those people? I mean, are there many people who are still at SeaWorld at... 45 who are yeah they get put out to pasture though so they get that's what we would say in the at work that they they toss us out like trash they put us at uh sea lion stadium or uh <laughs> which i'm sure my sea lion buddies will love to hear that but uh <laughs> but you know that's what they do they just like okay your body's broken down now you're older and uh despite all your relationships and your experience with these whales we're just going to move you we're going to move you to another area with animals you don't have a relationship with don't whatever because it is a young person's 
And it's such a, a conflict because to, for the whales, it takes so much experience and so mm -hmm. many years to get to that point, but then your body can't do it for very long. By so the you time this, you've worked to yeah. get there, you're actually, you have like a tiny window, as yeah. you've described it, tiny window of actually like being, being a professional to... athlete, almost. It, yes. That's exactly what, yeah. It you know, the like aches and pains are there when you're 23, but you overlook them, and then right. you're 40 or 32 or whatever. Right. It's like, this right. is too much. And they don't ever go lows. away. <laughs> huh? Yeah, those aches and pains at 42, or they don't go away. Where in yeah. 23, you wake up the next day and they're gone. <laughs> so. Mm -hmm. So when somebody moves to the sea lions, I mean, is there a movie bl called Black Lion coming, or? <laughs> I mean, is that, are those animals better cared for? Are they able to like get over the notion of what may be happening with the killer whales and two takes over? <laughs> or are they still, right, right. or do you just have to forget that that happened to keep your job and now you're working in a corporate sea world environment and yeah, sticking I, with it? Well, I think the sea lions, uh, I mean, those conditions, those animals, those facilities are even worse condition, you know, because obviously they do put most of the money with the killer whales mm -hmm. because it's the main attraction and obviously require more money and require more. But yeah, if anyone looks at the sea lion facilities, mm -hmm. uh, those are like deplorable conditions mm -hmm. for those animals. Those animals go blind. They have a lot of hip issues because they're always on the concrete and doing these, uh, you know, behaviors in the show that put a lot of stress on their joints. But, uh, so yeah, the killer whales is one issue where obviously their needs are not being met in that environment, but, if you go to Sea Lion Stadium or in Dolphin Stadium, those pools and those facilities are even worse. Hmm. There were, uh, I remember when the movie premiered at Sundance, oh, so many months ago. <laughs> seems like a long time, doesn't it? It seems like a real time. It must seem like yeah. a long time. It must be longer than making the film almost. Oh, clearly. The last seven months. <laughs> yeah. But I mean, there was a sense of fear almost in the room, a little bit of interpretation about, okay, we're going to show this in public and now we're going to see what kind of <laughs> excrement yeah. storm it comes from uh, SeaWorld. Is the, are, are you now over that hump? Is now that it's a public <clears throat> issue and everybody's seeing it, does it stop feeling Personally, so? no. I'm not over that hump. I mean, I'm never, I'm never not, I think, a little bit scared. So do people just get exhausted and unable to do that anymore? Is that, I mean, I don't know why you left, but... Uh, actually, technically, I, well, I left because I was so disenchanted by a lot of the things that were going on, but I was also able to take medical on my knee because I had so much cartilage destruction from years of killer whale water work because our bodies just get tore up doing that. I've had so many injuries and surgeries and but um, but you know I see personally uh, trainers, uh, female trainers that as they get older and they start to have families and their priorities shift you know the risk that they were willing to take with the whales when they were younger now that they have a child which I I can't relate to because I don't have my own children but you know then they're like I'm not willing to take this risk anymore and then also injuries force people out, um, family commitments force people out because it is just such a, that is your whole world and that's all you're, you're able to do and it's very risky. So is this a career for 20 somethings? Is that really in some ways the? That's always how I looked at it. I always sort of <clears throat> likened it to kind of your first job out of college and for whatever reason, you know, um, with your PhD in uh, marine biology, of course. Oh, clearly, <laughs> clearly. Um, yeah, I mean, you know, you you're out of college, and then the f in your mind, you you kind of think that you're this fully developed person. I mean, at least you know you're in your twenties or whatever, and you think, okay, I am who I am, mm -hmm. and um, and you actually take on, you know, the first job you get, oftentimes out of college, you kind of it kind you think it defines you, and you think that those people are going to be some of your best friends forever. And but you know it's the first time you really are a true sort of grown up. And so you're so um, impressionable at that age. And you know you're any you, the time your boss yells at you, mm -hmm. you just can't get over it. And it's you know um, you go out for drinks with friends and this this is your life. And um, you never realize that this is going to be one of many jobs and one of many lives and that you actually aren't necessarily really a fully developed person yet. Mm -hmm. So um, I always likened it to that because I remember having those jobs. Well, you're also fearless at that age. You're oh, yeah. fearless. Yeah. That you're fearless and you're, um, you're a pleaser, right? You're starting at the bottom mm -hmm. and you can sort of eyeball where you want to be and you know you have to take all sorts of stuff. Um, uh, to be able to sort of march up there and you need to shut up and be quiet when you see something bad um, uh, oftentimes and not talk back and not be an upstart. So, you know, it's all these things kind of um, that in my mind kind of, uh, I guess, sort of, you know, makes you vulnerable at that age. Mm -hmm. 
and you have to face your own mortality in that career you know because like you said and, and when you're younger you feel like you're going to live forever you're going to be the first person to never get old you know it's not going to happen to you and uh and you're you're physically fit and you're strong and you just feel like i can do this forever and then once you know because Doing Killerwell water work when I was in my 20s compared to doing Killerwell water work when I was in my mid 30s, it hurt like hell. I mean, and it was so much different. I actually even had to, you know, alter my style even in the water with the whales to compensate for now that the pain.